All right, as people are wandering in, I'm going to make a few announcements and then we'll go ahead and get started with uh, the next talk. So uh, the next couple of talks are going to be faster paced. These are all 20-minute uh, talks. Um, so after you're done it, and you've peppered your, the speakers with questions, uh, feel free to move around to the other rooms or stay in this one. Again, they're going to be uh, faster paced. We're trying to do more information uh, getting out to you guys. So be prepared for that. Uh, again, we love this hotel. This hotel mostly loves us. Please do not mess with the hotel. I know this is a hacker con and hackers like to, to break things. Don't break the hotel. If you want to break your laptop, you want to like, get some of the toys that the vendors are doing and break those, you want to buy another computer and break those, that's fine. Don't break the hotel. This hotel is really important to us. And uh, we would love to come back. And if you all break the hotel, we can't come back. So please don't do that. Um, second, uh, third, uh, we have more t-shirts and bags for crap available for sale. Again, we take no profit at all from the bags of crap and t-shirts for sale. Uh, that, all of that income goes directly to charity, uh, Hackers for Charity, EFF. Uh, please go to registration to do that. Um, they'll be for sale until today, until the last talk ends, and then again tomorrow once registration opens about 9.30. Uh, uh, let's see, party information. Details coming later. Uh, at a minimum, you'll have to have your badge. Um, all right, so some stuff to, get, to give away. Uh, so those of you that have any teenagers, you might know this answer. What is the largest moon of Saturn? Yeah, who, who called it first? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring it over in a second. So it, it's a uh, pop socket for your phone. The, uh, the thing that all the teenagers are using. Um, is anybody drinking um, not water? Yes. So, so uh, what I mean by not water, I mean like adult beverages. Is anybody drinking an adult beverage in here? Yeah. So uh, inf useful information when you're in a hotel. Hotels have these wonderful things called corking fees. So like if you bring an alcohol, uh, they charge you money to open the, the cap of that. So you shouldn't wander around with open containers. So to fix that, I have a Schmoo expandable water bottle for you. <laughs> Yay, good catch. Uh, so uh, open containers, alcohol, bad, don't do that. Uh, we don't want to get charged for, for you all bringing your own alcohol into the building. Uh, so the last thing that I have is another tactical notebook. So it's a moleskin system, zipper enclosures, has a carabiner if you want to hang it off your belt for reasons. Uh, and a mesh pocket, which is actually useful. Um, so uh, what is the, the thing that used to be thought of as uh, taking up all the extra space in space? Ether, who said ether first? It was somebody over here. I'm just going to do this. Congratulations. All right. So uh, without any further ado, I'm sure you're tired of hearing my voice. I would like you all to give a please give a warm welcome to Leah, who will be talking to us about the FCC net neutrality submissions. Uh, can you hear me OK? Sorry. Um, before I start, a fair disclosure, I'm totally nervous. I don't care how many talks I do, I'm always terrified. So before we start, um, I have a cat tax that I have to pay. Um, a little bit about me. Um, Leah Figaro, I'm the lead data engineer at Gravwall. And I'm an amateur lock picker and knitter. And that beautiful beast owns the house and runs it. Um, I actually have to jury rig spots for him not to intrude on my conference calls. Anyway, if you'd like to reach me, that's my email, my Twitter, and my key base. But I think you're here for the FCC stuff and not about me, so. Now, the FCC started talking about demolishing uh, net neutrality, which is the Title II, um, and Ajit Pai said, oh, come on, make comments, we'll take those into consideration. Um, during the course of the comments, 22 million comments were actually submitted, and 
as of January 1st, comments were still being submitted, but they weren't considered in the analysis that we did. There was allegations of mass tampering and um, bot submissions, but a lot of the research and papers that were presented didn't really look at the whole sum of the submissions. They just took bits and pieces of it. Um, and I've actually included those articles in an appendix if anyone wants to see those later. Um, basically, it appears that there is a lot of support that there was tampering going on. Now, the official period for public comment actually ran from April 27th through August 30th. The deadline was actually supposed to end August 16th, but the EFF and a bunch of other groups petitioned the government to actually extend that for an additional eight weeks because they said more people didn't know what was going on and they needed time. There was a compromise which meant everybody got screwed and they gave two more weeks. Um, the way that people actually submitted comments were either through a bulk comment, API, or through the web submission, and this is what the web submission looked like. If you went on and submitted any type of comment of the SEC, this is what it looks like. Now, to use the bulk upload, which a lot of people assume a bulk upload API is a sophisticated piece of software. In this case, it's not. You don't have to verify an email address. You just put it in, and it allowed bulk submissions and things such as CSV files full of comments. So at the end of September, uh, we actually ingested all of the comments uh, via our open source ingestered API, which are available on GitHub. I also have that listed if you want to look at how we pulled it, um, and proceeded through some basic data an uh, analytics. So the first exploratory data analysis showed this is the kind of comment frequency we are looking at. And there's some anomalies. So the FCC is only in the United States. And therefore, submissions, if they were truly human submissions, should not look like this. This does not follow any type of normal human behavior, so we decided to dig in deeper. So the first thing we looked at was batch submissions, or submissions via the batch API. And they appeared very, very different from those submitted via the web. The timestamps appeared very odd and shared common characteristics. These are just some examples of batch submissions. So you can kind of see the timestamp has a weird ending. Every single one of the batch submissions had that kind of ending. I'd also like to point out, no matter how many people you have submitting, 475,000 batch submissions in one second is kind of odd. So this is one of my favorites. <laughs> So Pornhub does not provide public email addresses, and so I re-verified, um, but as of July 2018, there was only 55 employees. So this means that either all 55 employees in July decided to send out over 18,000 comments each. Hashtag one of the 55. So anyway, this means one of two things. Either they were doing that, or someone is lying. These are the most popular email addresses given. Um, I'd like to point out the ones I've circled. So the Maitreya is actually a form of the Buddha who appears when humanity has begun its downward spiral. <laughs> the Siddhartha is also another form of Buddha, but this one is actually attached to a GitHub repository in India. I'm pretty sure the US does not include India. And of course, John Oliver. Everybody knows John Oliver loves Yahoo. Or maybe somebody's lying about all this stuff. So after stripping out all of the batch submissions, and this is not even looking at the leftover, what we call organic submissions, only about 17% of the total comments were actually organic submissions. By the time we hit August, only 1% of the comments were actually organic submissions. It's kind of a big deal. So the next thing we did was uh, stripping out all of the batch submissions, and we still looked at the data. And again, this looks really fishy. Bots appeared to still be submitting through the website. Um, I know it's a little hard to see here, but you can actually see people programming bots to submit via the web API. At times, we had people who lived in the state of state and city of city. So we could actually watch this occur. So they would submit a couple of hundred at a time, slowly poking, and after the code was corrected, we would get 40,000 repeated submissions, all in a short period of time. And humans don't act like that. 
Another hallmark of the submissions is that in the steady rate, you can kind of see when we zoom in on one of those. Um, but the email field being in all caps, 99% of the bot submissions that we identified that were related to the state of state and city of city, once that was corrected, their emails were all in caps. Most people, unless you're like 85 and just leave the caps lock on for everything, don't tend to submit their emails with caps. Now, after pulling out the very obvious bot submission, this begins to look a lot more like what we expect, but it's not quite right. So we finally started pulling out submitters who did not request an email confirmation. And this began to lead to the actual behavior that we expected. You'd see the ebbs and flows of interactions of humans, and since this is supposed to only be people in the US reporting on this, you see the typical behavior. Higher inputs when most people are awake because most people are on a day cycle, even if it's sort of staggered later. Um, and you can kind of see it drops off drastically when people are asleep, things like that. This is normal human behavior, and it looks very different from the bot submissions. You can actually see the difference in the two behaviors. So the other thing we looked at was the top organic comments. And before I get into the actual organic comics, I would like to point out a lot of the comments have the same wording. And that's not because someone is just spamming with bots. A lot of people actually took things like John Oliver's call to action, the battle for the net, used their scripts because they didn't know how to say, don't screw with my internet. Um, and they used it. And this instance, you can actually see 4400 pulled John Oliver's comment directly from the web and used it in their submission. Same thing happened in June. This is one of my favorites. So Battle for the Net actually had the script to help people post. And the interesting thing is you can actually see some of the characters. And This is, if you go to the Battle for the Net and pull the script and you just copy and paste it in, this is what happens. <laughs> and this one is actually from an article in TechCrunch. Um, it listed in the appendix. But basically, people saw this article where TechCrunch was asking people to do something and take a stand, and some people actually took them up on it. And a lot of the comments are much more just, please don't do this, or derivations of so. Again, I have an appendix. I have all of this stuff in the Google Doc if you'd like to see. These are my findings. So basically, a small minority of comments are unique, and unique and organic are interchangeable. Only about 17% are people actually going to the web. The highest occurrence of a single comment was over a million. Um, most comments were submitted in bulk and came, came in waves that were obviously incorrect information. The over a million comments in July from Pornhub. Um, bot notches can actually be observed. Uh, and it's really funny to see them. And because we didn't want those in there, we just ignored the bot, the bot submitted comments. And after removing batch and non-organic submissions, the remaining submission behavior reflected normal human behavior. You actually see the ebbs and flows in the daily behavior, but you also see an organic uprising with things like John Oliver's call to action, uh, the take back your internet day, and you saw a wave when people started posting articles about, hey, it's coming up, please do something. The majority of the raw total comments before we cleaned them were all anti-net neutrality. Net neutrality is gonna screw me, I don't need this. After we cleaned that all out, the people who submitted via the web API were overwhelmingly in support of net neutrality. So basically, people who submitted were overwhelmingly in support of net neutrality. Ah, let me play this. Nope. Sorry. I don't know if the sound will show up. <laughs> yes, Buster, we do. I'll come back here. Okay. So apparently, a Jeep Pie uh, never took Abraham Lincoln's advice seriously. <laughs> okay. So, do you have any questions or comments? 
really sure. Um, one of the things that we are eagerly awaiting is the findings. So the EFF and other organizations have actually sued the FCC to get the web logs. If we could see the web logs, we could start to piece out who is doing this. Um, I have suspicions, but there's no proof. Um, but I mean, I feel like some of the wording in the anti-net neutrality bot submissions came directly from an AT&T site, uh, citing support for destroying the net regulation. So my suspicions are there's probably some a variety of actors who are interested in making sure that the net neutrality re regulations are pulled down. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, the question is, why were batch submissions allowed? It goes against the spirit of the whole thing. I'm not really sure. Um, it appears in some conversations that I've seen that it was specifically requested so that it would make it easier for people to upload things, and I think that was heavily swayed towards anti-net neutrality regulations. Um, so I, yeah, it go, I, I feel very strongly that it goes against the whole thing, and I think it was a way to weight the comments and make it appear that people didn't want it. Was there a sense of uh, what, what data the uh, lawmakers, voters, uh, that were voting on the FCC regulations, what data they saw, whether they got any concept that it was bot submissions? Uh, the question is uh, whether or not the lawmakers were able to see what kind of data and if there was bot submissions. I'm not really sure. Um, I know Ajit Pai has since come out and said that um, that they don't really care what the comments say, and I think that's because more people have done analyses showing that a lot of this is not what the people want, and a lot of the, the comments are bunk. Any other questions? Um, the question is, what mass media outlet maybe made the most difference with net neutrality? Uh, a lot of it was John Oliver, the battle for the net, um, and that TechCrunch article, actually. Um, but the EFF and the battle for the net seemed to make one of the bigger um, contributions. And looking at the unique or organic comments, it seems to be a lot of grassroots people saying, go do this, or people like John Oliver saying, come on, listen. And you can actually see a giant... When you look at the data, you can actually see this ginormous spike right after uh, John Oliver's address. And then the Take Back Your Internet Day, which John Oliver pushed and a lot of other celebrities pushed, you also see that same giant spike of people going, I need to do something. Yes? Uh, the co question is, uh, have we found any other sites, uh, grassroots sites, that uh, were anti-net neutrality, similar to John Oliver's, but in the opposite direction? Is that um, Actually, the number was cleaning out the comments. The number of organic comments were so low. We were looking at some months with only 130 anti-net neutrality comments that were unique. Um, some of the scripts in the batch submissions were found on some mer uh, very conservative sites, but we had no way to verify whether or not they were legitimate submissions because we don't have access to those web logs. Um, there we go. And that is one thing that we're desperately hoping that comes out. Um, sorry, let me put the... Yeah. yeah, my appendix, if anyone wants to talk, I have documented everything that we talked about. Um, there. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so you can find some of the wording in the comments, but we have no way to at least do a de determination of how truthful the submission was versus with the actual um, organic pro-net neutrality submissions. We could, you know, these were individually someone going to the website. So we don't know if it was someone going to a uh, campaign and saying, hey, let's all work together and we'll do a batch submission for you on these local computers because you know you don't want net neutrality or if it was just someone harvesting email addresses. Yes. Um, the question is: Did the FCC, anyone from the FCC, do any of these analysis in order to determine um, if it was fake or not? And um, the answer is no, not that I know of. Um, yeah. <laughs> there any other? Oh, sorry. Um, you know, 
the actual, oh, the question is, um, did we do any analysis of a bot's missions to see if they were becoming more sophisticated and kind of breaking them out? No, actually. Um, the batch submissions that you see with the bot submissions, that was as sophisticated as they got. Basically pasting and, you know, it's an easy job. Nobody's going to believe it. Um, but yeah, basically the most sophisticated they did was change state of state to a correct thing, copy some verbiage that was anti-net neutrality, slap an email address in all caps in there, and then let it go. Any other questions? Um, we actually use the top, uh, so there's a lovely study, and I'm blanking on the name, but I can pull it up, that actually has some words, but we basically looked for pro-anti-net neutrality, um, and then physically went through some of the comments, because after we cleaned them out of the major batch submissions, we were a more able to see what was going on, um, and so we used the verbiage that you found in most of the pro-net neutrality scripts and the anti-net neutrality scripts to try and determine which camp they fell into, um, and then did a lot of spot check analyses to make sure that we weren't just making assumptions and the data. Oh, and that's it. I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.